Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming and joining us today at Microsoft Research. Uh, my name is Kim Ricketts, and I manage the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. So I'm hoping that if you're not already signed up on the Speaker Series alias, that you will. I noticed that this was one of those talks that looked like it just got forwarded and forwarded and forwarded. So the most efficient way is to sign up on the speaker alias on the auto groups site. Um, Today, um, I'm also, I did send out an email this morning to remind everyone that this room is going to be overcrowded, and look, uh, clearly, <laughs> they're all good students, all those people stayed home, but, or in their offices watching, we hope. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome Bob Herbold back to Microsoft. I'm sure many of you shared his tenure here. How many of you were here when Bob was here? No. Um, I probably don't need to tell you then that it was a time in Microsoft history when we saw a fourfold increase in revenue and a sevenfold <laughs> increase in profits. It was a success story. It is a success story by any standards. Yet today, Bob Herbold is here to discuss the very real danger of this kind of success. Um, those dangers. I can, I'll just say them out loud. We know what they are. A loss of a sense of urgency and the growth of something Bob calls legacy practices or complacency. In fact, as Bob shows with examples from GM, Rubbermaid, and others, um, that achieving great success is often the start of a long, painful journey to disaster. On the good side, Bob has also been studying those companies that have not only become hugely successful, but have learned how to stay there. And what they need to do to do it is actually a bunch of steps, sometimes painful steps, as he outlines in the book. But I'm thrilled that he's back to have this conversation with us. And we'll definitely have a Q&A period at the end. So please join me in welcoming back Bob Herbold. That's great. Thank you. Well, it's fun to be here. It's good to uh, be back in the world of friendly faces, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. As we go through this material, if you have questions, just jump in and raise your hand, and we will address them. Uh, we'll have, I think, time at the end, hopefully, to uh, uh, see what's on your mind as well. So with that, let's go ahead and begin. What I want to talk about, <clears throat> if uh, I can get the forward slide here, is uh, a couple of examples of companies that have run into problems, and then I want to step back and say, what's going on here? Why do people act like that? And then, most importantly, what do you do to avoid those kinds of problems that organizations seem to be able to consistently get them into? So that's what we're going to do. The first company that I want to focus on is Kodak. Everybody knows Kodak. Uh, this is a, a, a company that basically was the king, I say was, the king of photography. Uh, if you go back to the 80s, early 90s, this is a company that was regularly on the most admired company list from Fortune magazine, making great profits, uh, a very successful operation, hired really, really good people. Uh, and what they were facing uh, in the mid-90s was very interesting. If you say, what were the risks at that juncture uh, in the life of this company? There were really two. One was Fuji Film. What Fuji had figured out was that these folks at Kodak were getting away with a trick that they shouldn't be able to get away with. They were massively overstaffed, and consequently their film prices were obscenely high, but they seemed to have an incredible grip on the market. And Fuji looked at that and said, well, they got patent protection on Kodachrome, which is the fancy film that a few people might use, but not very many. Most people would use the standard, what was called yellow box, and uh, that wasn't protected. And it was clear that Fuji could match the quality of this film at a price that was far, far below. So Fuji went right after uh, Kodak directly on the film business and was really hurting them. At the same time, digital photography was starting to be uh, a real issue. I never will forget, Bill Gates had a habit of, uh, I assume he still does, of the people who are reporting directly to him would get a present every Christmas. And it would always be a piece of technology that was right at the bleeding edge. And so in 1995, the present was a Sony digital camera, one of the first digital cameras that actually you put a floppy disk in this camera. You took the pictures, then you took the floppy, stuck it in. You, did you own one? 
probably did, a few of you, being the technologist that you are. But it was marvelous because you could put that floppy on the PC, voila, there are the icons, you've got your picture. It's, it was an incredible a step forward and intervention in terms of what photography could become. At that juncture, Kodak was ignoring this whole thing. The reason why is they had their hands full on the film business where for the first time in their life they had a serious competitor in Fuji. Now let's crank the clock forward a couple of years and take a look at what was happening to this company. The stock price in that two year period of 96 and 97 had gone from $90 in 1995 down to 75. Their problem was primarily Fuji. Their profits were off 25% and that's why they get smacked relative to the stock price. Uh, the reaction on the part of Kodak was to lay off 20,000 people. And you might say, wow, it put a major dent in their workforce. It turns out it wasn't the case. They were so massively overstaffed, uh, over 100,000 people. And uh, it, it was, a, uh, frankly, too small a step, as they will subsequently learn. But the fact is that's, that was their reaction. They were in an incredible battle. The assessment by Wall Street was that they're moving too slow. Uh, meanwhile, competition was eating their lunch. It was an embarrassing situation for the company, primarily because they were losing their core film business. So let's move the calendar up two more years and say what's happening. First of all, the stock price isn't improving any. It's now down from that $75 level in 97 down to 65, uh, having come from 90 back in uh, 1995. The problems now are twofold, digital, uh, but primarily film prices. Uh, film prices at this juncture for the standard film that most consumers would buy was off 70% versus that original pricing back in 1995. So clearly uh, a huge inflection point relative to what was happening uh, in terms of film. Digital was really starting to become a reality with consumers, not with, with Kodak, with consumers. Kodak was continuing to not really put a whole lot of effort. They had some people assigned. In fact, I can recall when I was at Microsoft in this period that the folks from Kodak came out and talked to us from a technology standpoint in terms of what they were doing. But the fact is they got nothing done. Uh, and the company was preoccupied with getting killed by, by Fuji, which on one hand you can understand, but on the other hand they had to invent the future. So big serious problems. Their reaction was twofold. Number one, the CEO steps down. The uh, CEO had a couple more years available to the company, but they terminated his contract early. And uh, secondly, they produced a camera called Advantix. Now, you have to be honest, did any of you buy this camera back in 1999? No, you smart folks. This was the world's most unusual digital camera. This is the only digital camera ever produced that required film. <laughs> Believe it. You took the picture and it digitized it, but it then had a complicated device to impregnate film so that it was required to develop film to actually eventually get your pictures, which is totally absurd when you think about it and contrary to what all the other digital cameras were doing. New waves of digital cameras were coming out every three, four, five months at this juncture in 1999. In fact, the pace hasn't slowed that much even today. So the, once again, what did Wall Street say? Wall Street said Advantix was Kodak's most discouraging fa failure. I mean, it's, it said everything about what was going on at this company. How in the world can you create a digital camera that uses film? I mean, the only way you can do that is if you're so hung up on film that you can't imagine a world without film. And that's the box they were mentally in. How do you get into that situation? I mean, it's a company that hires smart people and hires hordes of them. And collectively, they're capable of doing super dumb things. That's a very interesting lesson. So let's move the calendar ahead three years this time to 2002 and ask what's going on. Well, by now, the stock price, remember, it was $90 a share back in 1995. It's now down to 40 bucks. And primarily now, it's a digital problem. The film business is very sick, but the fact is, digital is replacing film, and the growth of digital cameras was about plus 30% per year in 2002. So 
trauma in the, the, uh, the photography industry. And clearly at this juncture, Kodak is under major attack from these various, these two primary angles. What was their reaction? This new CEO that they brought in, his name was Dan Karp, and he was a 30-year veteran of Kodak, which was probably a mistake in the context of this is a guy probably that was also, you know, brought up on film, so to speak. But that's who was the CEO. His reaction when they were getting clobbered in 2002 was, for the first time, they cut dividends. Now, dividends to the Kodak shareholder was an important thing. Uh, they were meaningful. Uh, they had give, paid dividends for many, many, many years. And so they cut dividends by 72%. And they made a statement that they were going to get serious about digital photography. Now, this is seven years after Bill Gates has given out these digital cameras, you know, that clearly signal, wow, di you know, an inflection point in this industry. So they're claiming now they're going to get serious about digital. They're going to use the money from the dividends that they would have paid in order to fund this major effort against digital. Wall Street says investors have lost confidence that Kodak even knows what they're doing. So uh, the press continues to read it pretty accurately because it's clear that they, <laughs> they didn't know what to do. Now, moving ahead three more years to 2005, stock price $26 a share, down from $90 bucks, uh, 10 years earlier. So this has been just a constant decline, uh, almost a straight line. Digital at this juncture is outselling film six to one. That number today would be about 75 to one. In fact, if you were to go out this afternoon and say, okay, I'm gonna buy a film camera, you probably would be unsuccessful. It would be very hard to find that film camera. So basically the industry has completely morphed. Uh, what's happening? They, once again, have the CEO step down upon board pressure because the company is so sick. So this guy, Dan Karp, who had been put in uh, when the other CEO was asked to leave, is, uh, goes through the same process. So Wall Street's reaction, uh, world is changing faster than Kodak can. So it's an incredible story. Now, we've marched through 10 years. We haven't seen a change of behavior. Their whole business has basically been wiped out. Uh, upon uh, leaving, this guy, Dan Karp, made a most incredible statement. He said, and this is directly from the Wall Street Journal, uh, a quote from an article that summarized the situation. I saw my first digital camera at Kodak 20 years ago. That's interesting, you know. So this guy's a wizard now. Back in 1985, he saw a digital camera, and he knew right then. This is the CEO talking. He knew right then that the company was going to transform itself. Well, it didn't happen on his watch. What a stupid thing to say. I mean, <laughs> so it, this makes no sense, but these are real human beings that are generally viewed as smart folks that were, remember, the most admired, one of the most admired companies in America for, for a long period of time. So it's an amazing story. And the question is, you know, why do we see this kind of problem? I should also report today the, the Kodak stock price is basically still down in that mid $20 level and not much is happening. In fact, they, they uh, hired a fellow from uh, HP who's now the new CEO and their big idea is to go into the printer business. Now, going into the printer business and go head to head with the giant HP is not an easy task to contemplate. They claim their, their, that their secret in their success will be cheap ink. Uh, and so uh, how that all works out for them, we shall see. Maybe we will all be the beneficiaries and that they will cause uh, ink to uh, decrease in price. But I'm sure that's not a winning strategy long term. So this is a company it's sad to see, but the uh, obvious question is, wow, how do companies and organizations get themselves into these kinds of problems? And so in the process of putting this book together, I looked at 44 different companies. Some of them have had nothing but success. Some of them have had <laughs> nothing but failure recently, and we've just covered one. Uh, and some have been up and down. I talk about Apple in the book. And Apple's a company uh, that in the late 90s was on the ropes. In fact, uh, uh, finance people at Microsoft uh, pulled off a trick where we got a cross-patent license agreement with those folks. And, 
they got some cash, which they badly needed, and they allowed them to exist a bit longer. Little did we know that he'd take the cash and go invent an iPod, but, uh, <laughs> but the fact is, uh, it's interesting how some companies will go through these cycles. But IBM, Agilent, Nucor, I mean, there were a ton of them, and it was a fun project to do. What's amazing in terms of the research behind this book is you can get on the internet these days and say, okay, the company is Starbucks or the company is McDonald's, and you can track through year by year and see what the folks in the Financial Times are saying and see what the folks in Business Week are saying about these companies and the problems they get into. So this was a book that basically is, uh, is based on a lot of work in terms of investigating these companies through the use of the internet and being able to probe back 15, 20, 30 years in some cases. So the conclusion after looking at all these companies and watching all this strange behavior that these human beings are capable of is the following, that success is a huge business vulnerability because it does funny things to people. Namely, it causes them to lose their sense of urgency. Their degree of panic decreases. Their degree of paranoidness, so to speak, uh, isn't as intense, and that's a problem. Secondly, they get very proud of what they've done. Those people at Kodak are very proud of their company. In fact, the ones who are still there are crushed at what's going on and can't understand what happened. It's like you know, getting hit by a truck. But the fact is they were frozen in their prior practices and very protective of them. The third thing that happens is people get an entitlement mentality. They think they've arrived and that since I'm on top, I'm assuming that I will always be on top. And so that's how people think. So these issues emerge all the time uh, with companies that incur success. In fact, these things happen also just when stability occurs, when you get into a rhythm. I mean, how often have you been in a job and you say, well, you know, I've been here two or three years. I think I got the pattern of how this works. I think I know what to do to, you know, cope with everything and handle these problems. And as soon as you start feeling that degree of comfort and confidence on tackling your job, guess what? You're actually in trouble because you're going to get very set in your ways. And that's what happens to most people. Not all, but most. So the, qu the question that this book tries to focus on is, okay, given that these things happen with people, what do you do? Uh, and what causes these behaviors, and then what do you do to, uh, to deal with them? These behaviors lead to legacy practices, legacy people, legacy thinking. What do I mean by that? Taking the current procedures and basically freezing them and say, ha, it's my secret to success. And so you get people, especially when they're in their job long enough, will truly begin to believe that they have that job figured out. And even worse, sometimes the organizations end up concluding that those people are mission critical in that task. And often you're apprehensive about moving them out of the job because you fear they've got such, such in-depth uh, expertise that you face a business risk by moving them. So it turns out, I've, I mean, I've been in the business world for almost 40 years, and I've never seen a situation where you put fresh talent in a job Good people that know what they're doing in the context of they've got a good uh, head on their shoulders. They know how to operate with strong common sense. They do terrific work, and they'll catch on to that job very, very quickly. We shouldn't fear moving fresh talent into new jobs as much as we tend to do in an organizational setting. The second thing that these behaviors cause are a series of traps that, that organizations fall into. That's what I want to cover now is some of those traps. There are nine of them that I cover in the book, but I want to highlight a few and ask the question, what do you do to avoid this trap? The first one I want to talk about is sticking with your, your business model way too long. And by business model, I'm talking about the way you go to market, your set of products, uh, the way you uh, present them to customers, the way you approach customers, your interaction with customers, that whole thing uh, classified as the business model. If you think about that, one of the things that I think these, these various companies that I studied really taught me very clearly is you have to constantly worry about facing reality. And it turns out people aren't that good at that. But you have to be frank and objective with yourself as to what's going on and then really aggressively tackle those vulnerabilities. And there's no better example of this than IBM. IBM uh, was a very, is a very strange company over the years and very, very rich in terms of learning. 
If you look at the 80s, uh, especially the early 80s, this is a company that was extremely successful with the mainframes. Uh, the mid-80s brought on the PC revolution. Uh, they weren't watching. They, they, they marketed a PC, but they really weren't serious about it. Then DEC came along with the mini computer, and by the late 80s, this, this company was under attack uh, from a product standpoint. But secondly, the sales organization and the entire management structure of IBM by the early 90s was totally internally focused. This was a very complicated organization. In the late 80s, one of the roles I was playing was CIO at Procter & Gamble. And I can tell you that we detested these people because they couldn't care less about us. They had us right where we wanted, where they wanted us. We, we had mainframes because we had to process the business. And they knew we had to constantly upgrade those things. We knew, they knew we had to order more capacity, which they charged us obscenely for. So you get very angry that this lack of service mentality. Uh, so what happened? Well, by the 92, 93 time period, the CEO was under major attack, CEO of IBM, because this is a company that was losing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a quarter by this point. And he came up with a strategy that said, the only way to get this company back on a growth track is to break it up into 13 pieces. And he had logic behind how that breakup would occur. What was key, though, is all he did was talk about this for 18 months. He never did it. It, it could possibly have been a good idea. No one knows. I mean, it was one strategy to deal with the operation. But the fact is, all they did was talk, no action. They continued to lose money. And finally, after incredible pain, the board of directors had to make a decision to get rid of the CEO and put new leadership in. They hired a guy named Lou Gerstner who really wasn't a technologist. He was a McKinsey consultant who ran American Express and he had uh, uh, done a job over at RJR Nabisco uh, when there was an LBO. Uh, but uh, a guy who was fresh to the technology industry. And Gerstner came in and he wrote a, after he did what he did, he wrote a book. It was a very good read, I, I must tell you. It's called uh, Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? And what Gerstner describes in that book is the first six weeks when he was at IBM, he basically focused on two things. Number one, spending a ton of time with customers with no other IBM people present. Uh, and secondly, spending a lot of time with the research people in IBM in terms of what were they saying uh, in terms of the products and what bright ideas did exist, if any existed at all, in the research area. And after two months, he emerged uh, with a new strategy for the company. And he, he, for the first, he explains in this book, for the first time in his life, he used, a, he used email. And they called it the profs system at IBM. If any of you are former IBMers, you know all about that. And he wrote his first piece of email, and he sent it to all 300,000 plus employees at the same time, saying, we have a huge problem. Our customers detest us. And here's how they're feeling and why. You know, we're not paying attention to them. We're not doing what they need. We don't have the products that they need. We're not working with them in terms of the trends. Uh, and we have to fix this, this core problem. Secondly, it's very, very difficult here in IBM to get decisive decisions made, and we have to fix that. And so he said the new strategy is very simple. And this is how we're going to organize the company. We're going to solve the IT-related business problems of our customers. That's it. That's the new strategy. We're going to solve the IT-related business problems of our customers. And he said, because of that, we're going to reorganize this place around customers. And so you're going to be focused against General Motors, or you're going to be focused against AT&T, or Monsanto, or whatever. And you're no longer going to be, have allegiance to a particular product group or a particular geography, which is they had this complicated matrix that they spent all their time managing the matrix. And so Gerstner really totally reorganized the place and uh, uh, they got rid of a horde of people, like 70, 80, 90,000 people. 
<laughs> and he formed a group called IBM Services, Global Services, which was basically a group that would lead the charge in terms of the relationship with these customers. And Global Services, within two or three years, were generating tremendous revenue gains for IBM, and they pulled this company out of the, out of the, uh, the, the problem that they were in. And it was a remarkable story. But all Gerstner did is what's on that slide went out and talked to some customers, talked to product people, and said, okay, I think I got it. You know, this isn't hard. We just need to get our customers real happy with us and anxious to do business with us. And we have to figure out what it is they wanted to buy. What they wanted to buy was IT expertise to, to solve their business problems. They didn't want to buy a mainframe. They didn't want to buy a particular machine. They wanted their, their ordering system fixed, or they wanted state-of-the-art this, that, or the other thing. And the IBM people were designed organizationally to match with those particular tasks. It's, it's a great piece of learning. So facing reality is not easy. And IBM represents an example of, just like Kodak, for years and years and years, this huge company that hires really good people somehow is incapable of doing that. That's amazing when you think about it. Another thing that I want to talk about in terms of how do you keep up you know, to make sure that business model is absolutely fresh, you need to constantly look around at what's working in your industry and other industries and be ready to rip it off and apply it in your shop. And there's no better example of that than Nucor. Nucor, you may or may not have heard of. It happens to be the world's most successful steel company right now. It didn't exist in the early 80s. It did not exist. What existed was so-called big steel, eight steel companies that primarily were headquartered in, uh, in Pittsburgh and Cleveland. And the way real men made steel was they went to Minnesota and they got iron ore out of the Mesabi Range. They loaded it in big trucks, dumped it in these gigantic boats, and they hauled it across the Great Lakes to Cleveland and Pittsburgh and they crushed this iron ore in these gigantic blast furnaces and heated it up, forming ingots. Then they stocked the ingots, and then when somebody would want to order steel, they'd heat up these ingots, and they'd make the particular steel. And these blast furnaces were gigantic in size. That's the way real men made steel. Throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they were one of the strongest components of the American economy. Nucor came along and said, this is interesting. You know, we know that the Japanese have these very small electric arc furnaces that can uh, heat up steel that are far less expensive, uh, but very, very limited in their capacity. But boy, would, would, are they ever efficient. Secondly, there are a lot of companies these days that are hiring workforces that are non-union. Big Steel has nothing but union workers, and we could go the non-union route. Number three, we could do this regionally, you know, have a facility that would serve two or three states here in the U.S. at a time, and we could get a hold of warehouses that bankrupt companies have and pick it up really cheap, and we could put our small little electric arc furnaces in there. We could skip that stage where they deal with crushed rock and hauling that rock from these various places and instead buy, buy scrap steel because the scrap steel business is beginning to be large. And in particular, you could buy crushed cars at a reasonable price and simply heat them up in the electric arc furnaces and that's your source. And that's the way they went to market with what are called mini mills. Uh, they're still called that today. And what Nucor does is it has many mills all around the country, each one serving a local community. Each one, in one end, goes crushed cars and scrap steel. They heat it up in these small furnaces. They immediately make the product on the spot. There's no ingots that are formed. They start out with rebar. Uh, these are bars of steel that reinforce concrete. Big Steel looked at it in the 80s and laughed and said, what are these people doing? Everybody knows you don't make any money with rebar. Of course you don't when you have the kind of cost structure that Big Steel has. And Nucor made a ton of money with rebar. And then they went to flat steel, et, et cetera. And they just step by step became a major force. Today they've got all, virtually all the market cap uh, of U.S. steel, of, of U.S. based steel companies. 
And most of the big eight are, are bankrupt and out of business. There are a few that are left, but very few. So it's an incredible story of a company being formed just by looking around and saying, what are the bright ideas here? Now, the, the, the crux of the matter is, why wasn't U.S. Steel and Bethlehem Steel looking at this? There's an example of, that is in a, a book called Value Migration of Big Steel, U.S. Steel in particular, having an employee who on his vacation went to Japan to look at these small electric arc furnaces and was chastised by the company when he came back for wasting his time fiddling around with these things. And uh, so it, it tells you something about the culture. But reapplying what works and doing it in a fast manner is, is a very successful strategy for keeping that business model fresh. The last point I want to make in terms of, of business models uh, is beware of committees and compromise processes, especially if you're in the business of trying to generate big, distinctive, disruptive ideas. What sells in the marketplace, both from a product standpoint as well as a marketing standpoint, are things that make you a bit uncomfortable at first, that are a bit different, that are a little unusual and have some rough edges to them. Not rough edges, distinctive edges. What committees do to bright ideas is they knock all the sharp edges off of them so that they become acceptable to everybody around the table. That's good if you're trying to improve a process. That's terrible if you're trying to come up with exciting products or if you're trying to come up with great marketing. Because all of both product as well as marketing is all about distinctiveness and freshness and newness and things that cause people to take attention and say, wow, I haven't thought of this in that context and what it might do for me. So those kinds of compromise processes are deadly. I've worked with several companies in the last two years that have overdosed on Six Sigma. Six Sigma is a great tool for improving processes. It's a terrible tool to get product ideas exposed to because it's got so many meetings where everybody's supposed to bring in their their expertise and apply it to the problem. You don't need any expertise. When you have the, what individuals have great ideas, not committees. And so what committees do is tend to dampen those things down. There's no better example of this than Apple. When jobs did come back <clears throat> and get the money from Microsoft to uh, stay in business, uh, what happened was uh, he got fascinated by the music business and what might be possible. He was looking at Napster and realized, hey, it's illegal, but boy, they sure are hungry for it. And so is there a way to create a device that takes advantage of these key trends? And he formed a small group of people. And I'm talking small, six people. And he promised to them that he would keep this thing, that they had to keep this thing totally secret within the company, and he would keep it totally secret within the company. And he had an engineering person, he had a software person, he had an industrial designer by the name of Jonathan Ive, who they hired from the UK that has been a hero at Apple. And that team of people were the ones that developed the iPod. I think it's very fascinating when you read the stories about the development, how Jobs went out of his way to keep this thing secret within the company because he didn't want these people to get a lot of suggestions from other people in the company. He didn't want a lot of input. No thank you. Let them do their job to create something really, really special. It's a very interesting concept that is very important. And uh, uh, I know that when I was uh, running marketing at Procter & Gamble, uh, we were, as a company, this was in the early 90s, and a lot of US-based companies at that Point, we're overdosing on a thing called total quality. Total quality was like the precursor to Six Sigma. And it generates tons of meetings, which again is okay if you're in the process of improving a, 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 a manufacturing approach or whatever, but where you need expertise from different areas. But if your idea is to create great marketing. So we finally banned our marketing people from going to all these total quality people, uh, total quality meetings. So it, it, it's the same concept that we're talking about here. So let's march ahead here. One of the other traps I talk about, the second one, is uh, allowing your products to become outdated. I mean, this happens over and over again with organizations. And 
the trick is how do you you know avoid that pride that you have finally developed the perfect product what you constantly have to do is realize that in your industry as well as in un other industries there are inflection points where major change occurs in how people view things as well as what's capable of being put in front of people and you need to take advantage of those things i want to go through an example with mcdonald's the uh... the fast food uh... uh company because it's so telling this is a company that if Kodak was the king of photography, these people in the early 2000s were the king of fast food. They had 30,000 restaurants. They serve 46 million people a day and unique people. That is a mind-blowing number. What's, what was their image during this time? It was clear. It's a Big Mac and fries. So that's what this company was all about. Uh, now, the only problem with that was uh, they were getting in trouble from the standpoint of their marketing and their product flow given what consumers were starting to want. This was actually the longest title of any Fortune, artic Fortune magazine article ever put together. This is actually the title of this article, Fallen Arches. McDonald's has six straight earnings disappointments. Its stock's down 42%. We can't remember the jingle, what has happened. And that was the scenario in 2002. This company was really, really sick. Uh, the problems were primarily focused on, on a healthy food trend, and it was clear they were missing that trend. Once again, they were primarily known for Big Macs and fries. Slow service, their own research showed that, boy, it was taking longer and longer to get through this process of getting food. Employee ratings were lower and lower all the time in terms of uh, being rude. And they had a lousy string of ad campaigns that they kept changing. And that's always the death of a, of a brand image when you have to change those campaigns often. That's a horribly challenging environment. You just don't want to have to do that. But the real crux of the matter in terms of their problem was focused in 2003 when a movie emerged called Super Size Me. Okay, did it, how many of you saw this movie? Oh, man, a lot of you. This is, for those that didn't see it, this is a guy who eats only McDonald's for 30 straight days. Every meal, three meals a day for 30 days. And he always says during the order process, supersize me. He gains in that 30-day period 25 pounds, has pretty severe liver damage. And in fact, the damage to his liver was severe enough that on that 30th day, they had an ambulance waiting. And he ended up being in the hospital for eight days, recovering from what he had been through. That's a true story. This movie was nominated for an Academy Award. It didn't win an Academy Award, but it was nominated. So you talk about having your problem rubbed in your face. This was certainly the case. So this was obviously the low point uh, in the history of McDonald's. So what did they do? Uh, by late 2003, after this movie, their stock was off 70% versus 2000, but at least now they understood they had a major, major crisis. What do you do? New CEO, of course. You know. <laughs> You're getting the flavor for that. They finally, at long last, launched Great Salads, and they had marketed salads before, but not really seriously, plus the products weren't that good. These were terrific salads. Uh, they also provided all white meat chicken options, both for the kids' meals as well as the grown-up meals. And they launched a very good ad campaign. So the, big, the impact was very good. Same store sales were plus 11% versus a year ago. That degree of growth hadn't occurred in 30 years. They really pulled this company out. So the question is, you know, how in the world do you miss that kind of inflection point? And, and McDonald's certainly did. So in any industry, you've got to spot the inflection point, but you've got to get out in front of it and lead it. So when you think back at that Kodak example, he's completely missed an inflection point. And all they would have had to do in the, in the you know, mid-90s is stare closely at what people were fascinated by from a technology standpoint. Another trap is getting lulled into a, cu a culture that basically says, we're great, you know, this is a great place to work. This is, I mean, this is a very casual, comfortable place to work. So uh, that's risky. 
what you have to constantly do, if possible, is to grab a product edge and, you know, overhaul the culture constantly and get them excited about that direction. And there's no better example of this than Motorola. Uh, they've had a glorious past. This is a company that uh, was the first in car radios, they were first in battery-powered radios, walkie-talkies back in the, in the uh, early days. I mean, the World War II, the walkie-talkies put Motorola on maps. So, they invented the cell phone business in 1996. They launched the StarTech, which was a super small clamshell phone. In fact, in 95, Gates gave us that camera I talked about. In 96, we all got one of these small StarTech phones. So you can tell it was the rage if Bill bought it for the Christmas present. So. Late 90s, big trouble. Uh, what had happened is the business units had fragmented into incredible fiefdoms that wouldn't work with one another, uh, customer confusion. There were so many divisions of this company that big customers know, didn't know who to work with in order to get a point of view on what, Microsoft, or what uh, uh, Motorola is standing for. Huge wasted efforts. They chased smart cards forever. Smart cards, you can get away with it in Europe. They've been successful in some applications. In America, they've been dreadfully unsuccessful. And the people who have had the most difficult time understanding how the U.S. hates smart cards are the Motorola people. Uh, they also completely blew it on the PowerPC chip. They could have gone into business competing with Intel if they would have simply ported this fantastic chip over to a PC setting as opposed to sticking with the Macintosh. And the Macintosh went nowhere and Motorola went nowhere with it. Uh, this was also a joint effort with IBM. By the late 90s, uh, uh, the marketing has never been strong at Motorola. They're slow to move from analog to digital, so their cell phone business, which was at a 50 share at one point, now was down in the single digits because they completely missed the digital wireless revolution. They lost $2.6 billion on a crazy project called Iridium. Okay, now, did anybody have an Iridium satellite phone? Well, that's good. So we're two for two here. This thing, uh, I had a, a go fishing once a year with a group up to Alaska in 1999. No, it was year, yeah, 1999. We went up. This guy brings this big box, and we said, what's the box? He said, oh, wait, do you see it? It's a, cell, it's a satellite phone. We get out there, we can call anywhere. And uh, this is out of Sitka, Alaska. The trip was being taken, and it turns out that, well, this guy would go out on the shore at night getting this satellite phone cranked up, and he's uh, standing there out in the rain trying to line up this phone so that he can get reception, <laughs> paying $2.50 a minute, and meanwhile, we are all sitting on the porch of this lodge calling our spouses with a cell phone, you know. Anyway, they, they didn't cut the cord quick enough. A complete waste of money. But uh, uh, the last people to understand that were Motorola. Q1 of 2001, they got smacked badly. They lost over $200 million. That was their first loss in 16 years. This is a company that had a tremendous amount of pride. And there's really running into problems. Share price down to $17 versus 60 bucks two years earlier. One of their PVPs made this statement that was reported in Fortune magazine. You couldn't make a decision without needing 99 other people to make a decision. It was terrible. So too complicated. They're making it too hard to do things in this organization. So what do you do in the Q Q1? Yeah, don't laugh. Uh, <laughs> you see the pattern, OK? New CEO. The new CEO is a guy named Ed Zander, and he's from Sun Microsystems, the dreaded Sun Microsystems. And uh, he, he starts rooting around in R&D, and he uncovers this super thin Razor phone. And basically, Ed Zander used the Razor phone to reorganize the place and try and get the value system focused on, we have to do this kind of thing all the time. And he was really uh, being quite successful with it. The stock price was up to 26 bucks a share. And I told you they've never been strong on marketing. Uh, by early 2007, they made a huge marketing mistake. When competition, namely Samsung, started to come out with this, the super thin phones as well, Motorola simply dropped the price as opposed to innovating their Razer phone. What they should have done when they launched the Razer was four months later, launch the Super Razer, et cetera, et cetera, and, and kept the, the consumer excited. It didn't happen. So everybody ripped off the design, 
Motorola panicked and massively dropped the price, took the profit out of the whole industry. And now that industry is suffering from the standpoint of profitability and waiting for the next big invention that somebody can charge, you know, 300 bucks for the phone for a while. Uh, so they committed a dreadful marketing and product sin, and now they're back in the soup. And you're reading articles about Ed Zander may not be able to hang on. So it may be time again. So uh, that, that happens. So, you know, you look at these kinds of stories and you say, wow, these are smart people that are well-educated, and how in the world does that happen? But it does. And the focus of this book is, once again, what are the traps that these things lead to and how do you avoid these kinds of traps? And I think you would get a kick out of it. And with that, I will conclude. We'll open it up for questions, and I really thank you for the opportunity to chat this afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. What do you think of uh, Microsoft? I think that uh, Microsoft, as always, is in a challenging environment. Uh, the company's always been in a challenging environment. And what we have to do as a company is constantly come out with innovation that people are just screaming for. That's the secret to success in any organization. And so you have to get out there fast. Uh, right now, in the ad revenue business, we have to move fast. We have to do things that truly start us to, you know, to gain significant chunks of market share in that world. Because it's clear that from the standpoint of, uh, of technology, that that's going to be a key driver, a revenue driver, in the future. So we're moving into a couple of decades that are massively different than the past couple of decades. And that's no secret to anybody, and it's no secret to Microsoft. So just you know, getting out there with bright, fresh ideas that, that uh, win the fascination of consumers is what it's all about. It's not an easy thing to, uh, to turn big organizations, as we see with many of these examples. So that's the long and short of it. Yeah? So how often does firing a CEO work versus how often it doesn't work? And is there ever a chance of a turnaround without firing the CEO? Yeah, I think that uh, it's a very good question. And uh, I don't think it's necessary, but I think that it is a way to, to clearly bring in fresh fresh talent and the reason why these people get fired is they're not doing the basics of saying okay you know what's the challenge going to be tomorrow and how do we tackle it and having the nerve to say guess what we're not as good as we think we are so you say is well what are the companies in here that seem to do a good job of this where you go for this long string of success well I think uh, you'd put at the very top of the list would be Toyota and the culture of Toyota is all about every day coming up, whatever your job is in the company, every day coming up with a new way to do things. Continuous improvements called Kaizen. We'll talk about it in the book. A second example I'll give you is my prior employer, which is Procter & Gamble. Uh, has had a successful run of, you know, over 100 years of basically growing that business about 7 or 8% a year. Not humongous growth, but they're a fairly large company and they're growing fairly substantially. The culture in that company is very, very simple. What is the latest fresh idea that we're going to put in these consumer products that will cause our users to say, wow, this is interesting? And so the whole culture is focused on what's the next bright idea. And so finding unarticulated needs, finding needs that consumers can't even describe to you so that you pleasantly surprise them is what that company is all about. I think there have been companies that have, have uh, uh, turned it around uh, a bit, you know, in the context of their, their existing uh, CEOs. But uh, uh, to tell you the truth, in most cases, you need fresh thinking. Yeah. Yes, so it looks like uh, most of the companies in your book are large-sized companies. Yeah. So I just wonder, uh, to what extent the lessons you talk about in the book apply to this size of the business? Well, I would be hypothesizing in answering this question. The reason why it's hard to get a grip on small companies in regard to this issue is they tend not to get written about. And so you can't get the facts and figures the way you can with medium-sized to large-sized companies. But uh, 
since I'm convinced we're dealing with human nature here, these problems emerge not just in business. They emerge in government. The U.S. government has these problems in spades. We can't get anything done, okay? So I'm living half time in Asia these days, and I'm struck, we were talking before, by the governments in Asia are so focused on solving problems and making big decisions and they have a structure that enables them to make these giant decisions very, very crisply. So it happens in education systems and the like. So I'm pretty confident because we're dealing, I'm confident we're dealing with human behavior here. And so I don't think small companies are protected. In fact, how, you, know, you know a lot of small companies that get fascinated with what they invent and they can't take it to the next level. And so they end up waiting and waiting to get run over, and then eventually they get run over, or they get bought up, or whatever. But that happens a lot. So not data-based, but my hypothesis is it probably would apply. Yeah. Yes? Even though the majority of the 44 companies you looked at are North American, except for Toyota and Honda and such, but given the fact that you're spending half your time in Asia, do you find the trends that you talk about in your book apply in international markets too, or is it um, is there a strong bias that these factors come into play in the right. uh, American market or the American psyche? Well, one of the examples that I have in the book and I could have discussed here very easily would have been Sony. There's no company that has been killed like Sony has been killed uh, by Apple. I mean, if you think back, here are the people that invented portable music with the Walkman. And if any companies should have invented the iPod. It should have been Sony. They were the king of the hill in terms of Trinitron televisions. Probably many of you owned one. They were the state of the art in televisions in the, in the 90s. Samsung has killed them in TVs just be, with speed and technology. You look at the PlayStation, you know, they invented that industry and put it on the map, so to speak, and they've had a lot of trouble with the PlayStation 3, and of all people, Nintendo comes up with this incredibly creative product. Plus, Microsoft has given them a good battle with the Xbox 360, but you have to say hats off to Nintendo right now in terms of the amazing creativity that emerged in that, uh, that Wii system. So I, I don't think the Asians are protected. One of the things that is true, though, is that it's harder to get information on Asian companies than it is U.S. or European companies. So, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, I can, I'm convinced for the same reasons I answered your question that uh, the Asians are not protected from this. And I think Sony's a primary example, yeah. So going back to your very first example of Kodak and film and, yeah. and digital photography, you know, I could completely see you know, somebody like the Salesforce a CEO using the same example on us, saying the okay, business uh, applications is the film, uh, Kodak is Microsoft, and then they're the, the digital people. Yep. And you know, if you look back at what we've done, you know, we went ahead and bought uh, the Vision and Great Planes, which is which yep. bought the legacy players. And yep. in the meantime, you know, things like Salesforce, they first of all build the apps, yep. and then they opened up the market for smaller players yep. to sort of use that as a platform. Yep. Does that sort of bring, like, what's your point of view on that? Well, I think that uh, big companies tend to have a tougher time with speed than smaller companies. I mean, one of the things that Kim and I were talking about before uh, we were chatting while people were assembling was that there's a huge advantage when companies are understaffed because, by definition, you have to, all you have to delegate responsibility and hopefully accountability much deeper in the organization and things happen faster. People have to take more risks though because they don't have a lot of people to advise them. But the fact is things move faster and so speed is, is critical and I think uh, a lot of big organizations have trouble with that because when you hire people, once that individual is with the company for a week or two, they've already figured out what their logic is as to why they're mission critical. And they can explain to you why the whole place would collapse without them. And so you got hordes of people, and they're all mission critical. Give me a break, you know. It can't be. But, but people, that's what people do. And so it gets very complicated to get work done. And so 
I used to tell people all the time in terms of IT projects in particular, the best way to speed them up is to cut the staffing in half because people will focus on the basics and you'll get something done. When, when I arrived at Microsoft in 94, late 94, we could hardly close the books at the end of the quarter. You were around. Were you around in 94? Yeah, you know. I mean, uh, it was horrible. And so what we had to do, end up doing was cutting the number of information systems very significantly and going with a global approach where we said to people, this is so embarrassing. Because when big customers would come to Microsoft for, to spend a day to learn about gee whiz technologies in the lat latter part of the afternoon when things were getting casual, they'd say, tell us about how you do your finances. Our financial systems are a mess. And we'd have to sit there and say, well, we have to sit there and try and change the topic because it was so <laughs> embarrassing. But that's what we had to fix. And so we, we, our, the theme was we're going to become a showcase relative to these applications, which is one way to move the ball ahead and make it clear to people that they're about to incur massive change. So, staff change over time? Well, the IT staff got reduced by well over 50% during the 18-month period. You just didn't need all these people if you're going to have global systems. What's the hard part is grabbing them and getting them out of the system because people hoard them. I can remember going to Microsoft Germany my first time. I don't want to talk negatively about Europe, but the fact is, go to Microsoft Germany, and the, this was a sales subsidiary of Microsoft. The guy hands me his business card, and it says, President of Microsoft Germany. I thought, whoa, President. Well, if you're President of Microsoft Germany, you probably need your own HR people, right? You know, probably need your own IT people. You get the picture. And pretty soon, you're massively overstaffed. So we had to disassemble much of that. So, One more question. Yeah. Do you see Wall Street as a barrier to organizational change and the company's ability to be responsive? Yeah, I think Wall Street is a big barrier to change because you can't make decisive moves as quickly because they can be very, very punishing. I was saying, I had a meeting a couple weeks ago with a bunch of venture capital people and private equity people. I said, you know what you ought to do? You ought to buy Microsoft. And it would cost you about probably $450 billion, maybe. No, maybe. Probably $400 billion would buy it. And what would you do? You'd say, OK, I'm going to incur major pain for two years. And I'm going to put this thing on an advertising revenue-based model right now, reconfigure how we do work, and emerge with a company that probably wouldn't make as much profit as Microsoft did in the 80s and 90s. But let's face it, that was unusually large amounts of profit. And so we'll have to be satisfied with a lower degree of profit, but it would be very, very profitable company. We'd have our new business model, we'd be all set. Guess what? You can't do that when you're a, a traded company on the, on the stock exchange, because every quarter, you know, you'd have a lot of long faces to deal with and uh, mopey people. So. That's one of the key reasons why private equity is so popular these days, because at long last, you get to make some of these long-term decisions, plus you get to be a lot crisper in cutting out the cost, so huge advantage. So, Well, with that, we'll conclude. I want to keep you over on time, and thank you very much for attending. Thanks.